Thurman for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although Jordan Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Izzo's dying for a moving screen. It's that dreaded moving screen. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I am Brendan Quinn of The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhart of UM Hoops. Uh, the season has ended for Michigan State. The season has now ended for Michigan. Four teams remain. I'm headed to New Orleans on Wednesday. But today we will uh, we'll put a wrap on Michigan. and We will uh, talk a little Final Four, I'm sure. And we'll also get into the... Uh, never-ending conversation that is the Big Ten's ineptitude in the NCAA tournament. Dylan, how are you, man? I'm good. Uh, the season's over for everyone except you, so drink that coffee up and get ready for another week. Still kicking, man. As I said to you before we came on, I've got the uh, the late March head cold, which is very much a staple of covering the NCAA tournament for anyone uh, it's not COVID got tested. We're good. But, uh, yeah, so I probably a little nasally, probably sounding even worse than usual, but we're going to fight through as we say, give the people what they want. Although I don't know how much they want this podcast. The, uh, the, the end of the season ones probably don't do too great. <laughs> no, the, the, uh, sweet 16 preview probably does a little better than the sweet 16 yeah. loss recap, but Hey, we got to do it. People will love to, I mean, big 10 stuff. People are always here to shit on the big 10 True. a little bit. So Absolutely. stay tuned for that on the back half of the pod. Uh, Michigan falls to Villanova 63 55 in a 62 possession game in a kind of empty-ish atmosphere yeah. in uh, San Antonio. It wasn't the most riveting game. The fans were, the tickets were mostly sold to fans of the late game. Uh, and then Villanova's style of play just sucked all the life out of that game. I never really realized how much Villanova was Wisconsin East, but it's very much part Ooh. of the brand. Um, I, it was just kind of what they've done all tournament and Michigan just fell short. What were your takes? It was probably the first time you'd seen Michigan in person since that Indiana game. Uh, yeah. A little different than that, but what what do you think of of that game? I guess. Yeah, I kind of uh, that night and even after that was really kind of just torn on going back and forth between like, man, how much of it was just what Villanova did to Michigan and and the way they play and the way they defend and. And all the little things that Villanova does that, you know, speak to why the program is what it is um, versus, you know, Michigan self-inflicted stuff. And I think there was a balance there. It was a very winnable game for Michigan. Um, But at the same time, it's like, well, sometimes Villanova makes its own luck in the way that it does things. You know what I mean? So, but with Michigan, it's hard. And like talking to some of the people in the program the next day, um, there really was that just kind of, empty feeling coming out of it when you you just replay certain things you replay the missed free throws in the first half you replay a couple unforced turnovers in the first half like Musa Diabate for all the good stuff he did like there was just those two three possessions right where there's just those mistakes that goddamn in a 62 possession game like you said you just can't have those you know if the other team gets a steal so be it but you can't make your own mistakes um and then with with the Dickinson element of things and all the missed bunnies and all that, some of it was missed shots. And some of it was the fact that, you know, Villanova, even though it's an undersized height-wise front line, man, they just, they are physically relentless. And when you make first contact on your post touches, they don't back down. So what might be a... Normally a four or five foot little hook is suddenly a six foot hook. And, you know, some of those misses were from Villanova. Some of them were though. Yeah. Michigan just missed some shots, man. And you want them back and it would really easily be a different game. Yeah. it It's hard because when you lose in the NCAA tournament, usually you don't look good doing it, right? Something yeah. goes wrong along the way. Something that you're good at has to fail to lose the game, right? Like, Franz Wagner's last game at, last year was yeah. horrific in the NCAA tournament. It doesn't mean Franz Wagner wasn't really good and a big reason Michigan got there. It just means like when you're the best player on a team, you need to 
bring your best effort every game or you're going to lose. And Michigan needed Hunter Dickinson to play like an all American every game in the NCAA tournament to win. He did it twice. He didn't do it against Villanova. I do think there's something to like Villanova was undersized, but they were able to play kind of a defensive style that they always play, which helps, I think, to uh, like, like they didn't have to change who they were in a weird sense because they'd been playing that way. And it made it just uncomfortable for Hunter Dickinson where it was just a different kind of defense than he's seen. He, he wasn't able to kind of take those two or three dribbles into his spots and then operate or draw on the double and then mm-hmm. pass. It was more of impacting him on the catch and he just never got comfortable. And then he missed shots that he made last week. And that's why Michigan lost this week and won the week before. And that's just part of the game. Um, I think you can look at other parts the same way, right? Like Eli Brooks made more tough finishing shots on ball creation shots last week than he's ever made. Then he went two of nine inside the arc and just missed a lot of those shots that he made last week. Sooner or later, like you have to make those shots to keep winning. If you miss them, you lose. It sounds kind of simple, but you're just never really going to win a game shooting 35% on twos. And I don't think you can say it's all Villanova because again, it's not like they're a top ranked two point defense in the country. It's not like they had all this length and swarm. It's just, They played a good defensive game. Michigan missed some shots. Villanova hit a few more shots. Like it's not really how I expected this Michigan team to go out, right? Like you would have expected some kind of shootout where Michigan just can't get stops. Michigan's defense actually played pretty well in all three NCAA tournament games relative to how they played for the first four or five months of the season. So it's definitely a weird one. Um, I do think the big takeaway is just, it was Villanova's game, the tempo, the, just the way it was played, Michigan could never really speed them up. Michigan could never really turn it into the game Michigan wanted. And that's sort of what Villanova does at this point, right? It's just, they're very disciplined they're very, they do exactly what they want to do. And I think that that's hard to combat um, in a single elimination tournament. As they've seen, they're going to the final four. Yeah. I mean, it's the, you, they're one of those teams you just don't have a margin for error against. And, you know, they, they, they made some, you know, you go seven for 14 on the foul line. Like Villanova is the number one free throw shooting team in the country. You know, they're back there. They're going to make theirs count. Um, you can't miss yours. And, and Michigan did. And it was interesting to the, the stuff with Dickinson defensively, because it was, it was, Really fascinating hearing Jay Wright after the game talk about their plan and, and how much of it was just the little things, just the little things that they game plan for where it's just, you know, changing the angles in which he's catching the ball at. And like all these little things that they do to make up for the fact that, yeah, they don't have some big seven footer or some guy with elite length or or whatever. Um, you know, they're just going to they're obviously supremely well coached and, and they're going to find a way to. Um, make you uncomfortable. So that's really what it it boiled down to. But, you know, yeah, I think that's long term, though, that's going to be a game that's going to annoy Michigan that they lost that game. Oh, yeah. Because it was, it was, I mean, it was right there. Is there a loss in the NC tournament that's not going to, like, you know, I mean, same thing last year, UCLA game, that's going to, that was go to the final four and Michigan played terrible. Like, I feel like that's just, that's part of it, right? It's, I, I guess like, sometimes, I think, like, sometimes point is like, just wiped off the floor, but I'm sure Tennessee's going home saying, wow, we had three or four wide open threes in the last four minutes. We should have been playing the next weekend. Like I think any sort of competitive game is going to leave that taste in your mouth, but I, I hear what you're saying. And like, I just, yeah, I like, don't know what. I, I know. I think it's, but like last year was the, you know, they had a bunch of turnovers. They went three for 13, I think on or three for 11 looks like, yeah. Three for 11 on threes. Like, So it's like missing shots and like, you know, being turned over is one thing, you know, committing your own turnovers and missing your own layups and missing your own free throws, kind of a different deal. Um, Actually, then they missed free throws against UCLA too. They went six for 11 in that game. Yeah, it's very similar. Um, Like, I think those two games are very similar. Yeah, it is. Um, And I don't think there's any kind of unifying thread. I think it's just shit that happens. Um, But yeah, so where... Where, where do things go from here? I mean, do you want to talk about the takes, quick takes on the roster, or what do you think? Yeah, well, first, like, I think it's worth just taking a step back and looking at the season, right? I think 
the, I wrote a thing today, just kind of looking back on the scene. I think the best way to put it is this Michigan team was just always running from the shadow of the expectations of what everyone thought they could be. And I think that kind of took away from maybe what they were at any given point in the season. Um, obviously, like the first two months of the season, everything went wrong. I think Michigan thought they were a lot better team than they were, quickly learned that they weren't that team. Um, but really, since the COVID pause or whatnot, since that Illinois game, they were a pretty good team. Like this was a top 30 team. If the circumstances had been flipped in any different way and it wasn't this preseason top 10 team, I think we'd be talking more about kind of their improvement down the stretch. Uh, a lot was made of the one win, one loss, one win, one loss as an inconsistency. Michigan also never lost two games in a row and never let the season spiral out of control when there were so many chances to let it spiral out of control. So I think some credit has to be given to keeping it on the rails and then figuring out how to win a pair of games in the NCAA tournament. Like all things considered, that's a lot different than maybe where we might've thought was possible on what, like the end of January, the end of December, the hell, the end of February. Right. So I think like, I don't know what grade you give Michigan for this year, but by and large, I think, the work they did in the last month, month and a half sort of shapes the narrative a lot differently than it could have been. I mean, is, do you think they're in hindsight, when we look back, is there going to be any level of like, man, maybe they should have been able to find a way to make that the roster work uh, a little bit better or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like, is there going to be like, how much of, of there is going, how much of it is going to be like some level of hindsight on, um, man, there was a lot of talent on this team and they never quite figured out how to make it as functional as possible. And that Maybe that's not fair. I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing. Yeah, like for me, the gap was more in maybe we shouldn't have thought they were going to be as good as they were before the season, right? Like I look at this roster and you say, wow, they were really bad defensively. But then you look at the roster and where's the great defensive players that are going to make a great defense? Um I'm not going to say who is hyping up this team defensively in the preseason. I won't, I will not say that. But. I thought they'd be good. And I, like, I think you look at Musa Diabate defensively. I expected him to be a, like an impact defender in a, in a way that he just wasn't. Um, right. He was right. way better offensively than I expected, but he was not a game changing defender. And I think a lot of Michigan's projection defensively, hinged on that it turns out where you need someone else to kind of create some of those defensive advantages for you and he wasn't really the rim protector people would think like I don't think anyone would have said Musa Diabate will have a lower block rate than Hunter Dickinson this year right I right so I think you look at that and it's not just all on him as much as it's like everyone else needed help right you need help defensively if you have Hunter Dickinson if you have Caleb Houston if you have Devontae Jones these guys aren't elite defensive players and I think last year you looked, Franz Wagner made everyone look better defensively. Michigan maybe didn't need a Franz Wagner, but needed someone that could guard the best wing on the other team, maybe help a little more and create some deflections and just kind of be that game changer defensively. And the roster just didn't have it. At the same time, I would say offensively, by the end of the year, I would say this team got just about everything you could get out of the talent that was on the roster. I mean, their top 25 offense with, out really any great shooting, uh, like no 40% three point shooters on the team. Um, they really figured out a way to get Hunter Dickinson involved in a way that they couldn't early. So I mm -hmm. like before the year we said, okay, Michigan will be a better team at the end of the year than they are at the start of the year. And they'll grow into that. Like that was kind of how we looked at it. And, and they did, they didn't grow into a top 10 team, but I, I don't know that in hindsight, they should have been that much better either. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering more and more um, how much we should be adjusting expectations for freshmen as college basketball kind of oddly gets older here. Like the, the game is getting older and more and more, I feel like you're seeing less and less production out of supposed high level freshmen you know, outside of your top five guys, basically, right? Your Jabari Smiths, your Chets, your you know, your Pablos, like guys like that, right? Um, that middle ground, like you're just not. I, you know, I feel like the way that we were thinking about Diabate and 
and Houston and even you know, like a Max Christie too. It's not just these guys. It, it's I think it's freshmen by and large. Um, again, outside of that top like five or ten, whatever. Um, that is, it's just not quite as impactful, maybe as you just want to assume coming into things based on um, based on high school film, based on AAU, even based on FIBA shit. You know, like so much of the expectations of this team were heaped upon those two guys. You know that that Houston was going to be an elite shooter, and that Diabate was going to be an elite defensive presence, and this switchable guy, and he was going to do all of this and all of that, and. I think that's what really skewed the level of expectations. Cause when you look across the board, otherwise like Dickinson matched expectations, he played to borderline all American Devonte Jones. I think probably by the end was exceeding um, some yeah, level of expectations. By the end is doing a lot the of work end. there though. Right. Like, yeah. I think that also the time it took for those guys to get to where they got also plays a factor, right? Like if you were to go look, if, if you were going to say, okay, Musa Diabate is going to have a 20% usage, 108 offensive rating, he's going to play 6% of minutes, like the numbers projection wise seem fairly reasonable, right? Like he was actually really good offensively. His rebounding numbers are through the roof. He did a lot. Um, if you're going to say Caleb Houston led the team in three point makes, like you'd probably believe that, right? So it's a weird situation where it, I think it was the com- combination of, Maybe like, yes, they're, it's hard to count on a freshman to come in and be the f- best usage guy on a team that actually wins. You have guys like uh, yes. McGowan's at Nebraska who like, yeah, you can go score 25 points, but your team's going to lose a lot. And I think that that's the balance that's hard to strike. Right. And it takes time. Like even Malachi Branham, who was incredible the last three months of the year, was averaging like five, six points a game in mm-hmm. November and December. So I think there's a growth curve. and the age i don't think it's just transfers but all these covid year kids who are back like fifth year players change that even more significantly right like these guys are should be playing in estonia or wherever else and like they're grown grown adults going against 18 year olds it's a big difference and i think you look that certainly plays a factor and the crazy thing is michigan's going to be an even younger team next year most likely i mean you look at I mean, take take out the the teams that are still playing, right? Because that's the the tournament works in mysterious ways on who actually gets through, and obviously it's a bunch of blue bloods. But like top fifteen in in Ken Palm, like there there's not that many freshmen in that in those groups where you're like, yeah, they're like arguably the best player on the team, right? It's Chet, right? Shit, like I mean, Ty Ty Washington was important at Kentucky, but like all these teams. Their young guys are sophomores for the most. Kennedy part. probably, and then Kennedy they, Chandler. and then they, Kennedy Chandler, right? But all those other ones, you look at that top fifteen, borderline top twenty of Ken Palm. It, they're all older teams. Um, Michigan just never had it. Even its best player is still only a sophomore. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think I, sophomore pros are the most valuable asset in college basketball, right? If you have a guy who's good enough to be a pro and comes back for another year he understands what it takes to play college basketball and has that sort of first round talent. That's a game changer. And that's what I think you see on a lot of, like that's Arizona's whole team is basically guys like, right. They're good enough to be drafted. They've been through a year, right? Like Arizona wasn't anything special last year because these guys were learning how to play college basketball. When you can go into a year and you know how to play college basketball and you're talented enough to be a pro that changes the whole game. I would say. So. Obviously, Devonte. Do you want to get into the roster a little yeah, bit? Yeah, let's for next let's year. Let's talk roster. Yeah, Devonte's already said he's not coming back. I don't think that's overly surprising. Um, and now there's decisions pending on Dickinson, Diabate, Houston. I haven't missed anything, right? There's no word on any of those three formally. Not, not yet. Nope. Brandon Johns will be moving on, and then um, so give a quick overview of who's coming in. So coming in. Uh, Doug McDaniel, point guard, uh, lightning quick, uh, very small. Love his ball screen feel, way that he can play point guard. Shots a little questionable. Ability to score in the Big Ten when you're under six foot, maybe a little questionable, but really good player. Um, Terrace Reed is more of a 
traditional big man, a little bit below the rim, but has really good length, um, good motor, transferred to Link Academy. So got some good competition this year. I think he'll probably factor into the front court minutes. I, he's not going to be a step in and score like Hunter Dickinson player, but he can do some things. Uh, Jet Howard, six, seven ish wing. Uh, he's played at IMG, which makes it a little hard to evaluate him because that kind of leaves him in a very specific role. Um, but long at pretty athletic can shoot, um, developing kind of that off the dribble secondary playmaking role. Uh, I think he will mostly be looked at as a big shooter as a freshman, but has kind of that size and versatility. Then Greg Glenn is kind of a jack of all trades, six, seven ish, six, eight ish combo forward. It's actually a really good passer. Um, bit of a questionable shooter and his stock slipped a bit, but still like a borderline top 100 recruit. Um, another combo forward to throw on, throw on the pile there. So that's the incoming class. So, I mean, the decisions that are coming here are enormous, right? Because this thing could be, if you get everyone back, shit, you are, you're pretty loaded, I think. Um, and, and all these guys have experience. And like, there's a scenario here where Michigan is very legit heading into next year with all the experience that, like you just talked about experienced sophomores who are pros, they would potentially have two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, Dickinson, shit, you can put together an NIL package for him that will be more than he would get on a two-way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Does he want to play another year of college basketball? Does he want to do this again? Blah, 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 blah. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, but there is a scenario where Michigan is really good. There is also a scenario where Michigan is bare bones and has to go attack the portal in a big way. Yeah. Fair? I mean, <laughs> right now, you're looking at, like, as the roster is right now, every scholarship is spoken for. Uh, you could have the NBA moves work out in a way where you don't return any starters, or you could Mm -hmm. have the moves work out in a way where you return three starters who were able to make NBA decisions one way or another. Like that's a massive change and it changes everything about what you'd want to get in the portal, what you want to do. And that's before anyone potentially transferring out or anything else. So it's really hard to look at this roster because all of these decisions have to be Mm -hmm. made still, right? Like it, if Hunter Dickinson's back, you're building a completely different team than if he's not, regardless of what the other decisions are. For it changes sure. everything about how you want to play. Um, like Caleb Houston, I think, I know a lot of people are down on Caleb Houston, would be a really, really, really good sophomore in the Big Ten. And I think I agree. he would be a preseason all Big Ten type guy. Uh, I, that would change how you could play, regardless of the other decisions, right? Um, and the transfer portal decisions are tough because – you want to shape your roster differently, but the NBA draft deadline to withdraw is not till what June 1st after the combine. So, right. I, I don't really know how you play that. It's tricky. You don't even have any scholarships right now, technically. So you right. got to have some clarity sooner than later, I would say. Yeah. And I mean, these meetings that they're going to have right now are going to be really important and, and she, I, it transfers out the, in the same way. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you just have no idea how, certain guys are feeling about themselves or their place in the, or like an Isaiah Barnes, like what is Isaiah Barnes, right? Like he's still there. Um, and, and, and put in a year of work in the program. Like they watched him in practice. They know what they have. Um, and he probably knows where he stands. So a guy like that, a guy like Cheddar, a guy like Kobe Bufkin, Frankie Collins, how do these guys, Terrence Williams, how do these guys feel about their place long-term in the program? Those are the conversations that have to be had right now. And those are very different ones than trying to get a feel for Diabate, Houston, Dickinson on what they want to do, because you're right. Like when you go into the portal, you're not just fishing for talent. Like you, you want to be go- going for very specific needs. Um, Cause you want someone who's going to play, you know, you don't want someone who's getting a campus that you're just, you're getting a feel for in workouts. Like that doesn't do you any good. Um, you need to know what you're going for and you need to identify guys in those specific areas. So um, I, I, like Michigan's already kicked the tires, I believe on, on some guys. Uh, yeah. There's you been know, there, several names out there. Um, you know, like anybody you have to anticipate, like, yes, you have a full lot right now for scholarships. What are really the expectations of that being that way in one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you know, there's going to be something that's just the nature of the business. Yeah. And I think like you can look, you can go through the list of names that have 
lists in Michigan. And again, like interest and lists, this point in the process can be a little bit tenuous depending on how the interview right. is done and whatever else. But like everyone from point guard, like Sam Sessoms to athletic wing, like Terrence Shannon at Texas Tech, uh, the big man at uh, Utah Valley State. Uh, oh, for yeah. Ours. Um, so there's like all these different guys, but like you can go up uh, Taylor Funk from St. Joe's list in Michigan. Um, yeah. So these are all different positions, right? Stretch shooter, tr- mm-hmm. traditional big point guard. I think Michigan will cast a pretty wide net in the portal now while it tries to evaluate what's going on and then try to figure out how all those pieces fit together. Um, like, I think the big questions are going to like, if you look at the roster, even if everyone comes back or whatever, I think you do need guard help. Um, I don't know if it needs to be a mm-hmm. point guard. It might, you might want more size and more of like a combo guard, but the only two guard on the roster is Kobe Bufkin. And I think you could pitch a case that he could be the breakout player of Michigan next year, or that he'd be on a different roster. Like, I feel like there's a wide range of outcomes for him based on how the season went. Um, he was very young, um, like younger than most freshmen. And I think that plays a factor, but it's just, there's a lot to sort out with this roster and it's going to be a really key off season for Juwan Howard to kind of figure out how to play it. And it's going to be a lot of finesse to get pieces together at the right times that fit together. Yeah. I mean, whether it's a combo guard or, or whatever, like you do need to address shooting in some way. Um, you know, yeah. If, you know, if Houston's back, that's great. But I mean, if you're losing Houston and Eli Brooks, like, okay, who's making shots? At, at this point, right? This team that as it was finished 11th in the big 10 in three point shooting. Um, and the games that it's, that it lost were not just bad shooting nights. They were awful shooting nights. Um, there was like three point shooting is just something that this current construction lacks. Um, and whether at the same it's time though, what if you're starting jet and Caleb next year, do you really need to get shooting in the portal or do you need to get, if I'm, if I'm starting who and Caleb jet and Caleb, on the wing. Uh, They're both yeah, I don't know. Shoot. I mean, I just Caleb Houston, I told I was told was going to be uh one of the best shooters to come through Michigan in a long time. And uh his three point shooting was not that. Okay? Yeah, but he shot 30 so, like, percent from three in the Big Ten, right? Like right by the end it came around. I agree. I agree. I'm just saying, like, if you're if you're going into the year and you're telling me I'm I'm banking on Jet Howard as a three point shooter, I'm not I'm not ready to to take that bait. Yeah, my point is just if Caleb is back. You would look at, I would personally think someone like Terrence Shannon, who's an athletic defensive minded wing who can do a couple different things would be a better fit, even if he's not a good shooter. So it's one of those things where it's a sliding like Shondi Brown think. type. Yeah. And Sha- yeah. I mean, Shondi shot it really well, but like, just you want someone who's a little different than Caleb, but if Caleb's gone and you don't have any proven shooters, then you got to go get someone who you can really count on to shoot yeah. 40% and, provide that spacing. And here's the other thing. We're having this entire conversation and a, a year, we're only a year removed from what, talking about Michigan and and probably under anticipating the in, the impact of losing Franz Wagner, Isaiah Livers, um I'm forgetting another veteran, Shawnee Brown and Mike Smith, right? Mm-hmm. Well, this group's losing Eli Brooks, mm-hmm. who was coaching the entire team on the court. Even year. by the end of the year, even yep. by the end of the year, he was telling everyone where to go. He was calling out every switch, every stay, every this, every that. Anyone who ever picked up anyone in transition on defense was basically being pointed there by Eli Brooks. What does this look like without him is has to be creating some cold sweats, I think, in the coaching office. Yeah. And there's no upperclassmen really on the roster. There's, there's right? no Harris reasonable be the only replacement. junior who's yeah. played minutes on the team. There's no seniors on the team. So you're looking down like Michigan was young and inexperienced this year, but it had Eli Brooks to bail it out of different spots along the way. Right. You're there's no Eli Brooks. There's no, not even close. There's no one who's going to be that guy necessarily. And that is another reason. Like you have to get some sort of experience, I would say, or just to figure that out. Cause I don't know, man, like that's a young team, right? Especially if, if Hunter Dickinson leaves, you have Jace and you have, uh, um, Terrence as the only juniors on the team, right? right? Like that's, that's young. Michigan was 296 in experience this year. They'd be even younger next year, I'd say. So a lot yeah. to figure out. Um, and 
could still go in really any different way. Like what's your take on point guard? I'm curious. Frankie Collins had a really good week in Indianapolis. Um, I'm a big fan of Doug McDaniel. Do you f- feel so, confident going into next year with those guys as your point guards? I go, I go back and forth and partially it's because, right. Okay. Do you, I don't know if, if I'm Michigan, if I'm in the, if I'm on the staff or if I'm a, or if even I'm a fan, right. I don't know how I really feel about being a place that just continues to just bring in fifth year point guard after fifth year point guard after. I don't think that's the play long term. Mm-hmm. I you, you need to be developing your own guys at certain positions, especially Eli Brooks being like the prime example. You had a guy who was there for five years. He got it. He understood everything because like it's not plug and play. This is not the NBA where guys can just come in on ten days. And B, you know, it's all the same language at every place. It's all the same this. It's all the same that. Like, you can do that at certain spots, but I want my point guards to be program guys. Um, So at some point, you got to cut that cord, right? And say, all right, we're going to do it. And yeah, the first half of the year might be brutal watching Frankie Collins try to become a a 30-minute-a-game point guard or him and Doug McDaniel splitting time or whatever it may be. But... You know, like, is there something to be said for you got to do it at some point? And if not now, when? I completely agree with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But, at but the you don't want to risk an entire season. Collins exactly. shoots 44% at the free throw line and 17% from three and has a 28% turnover rate. And obviously, he didn't play a lot. I There's a risk to that. Yeah. You, you'd rather cut the cord where you had someone who – was actually making a play to take minutes away from the transfer you brought in and you feel good about it, right? Like that would be, it's one thing to just rip the bandaid off. It's something else if you can kind of grow out of it. Mm -hmm. And I get that it's sort of a chicken or the egg, like which comes first, right? Like you have to give someone a chance to really be that guy, especially a point guard, but it's a risk. And Doug McDaniel's small, like I, Frankie is most- really good defensively. So I think that's important to note. Like, yes, that was legit. And that showed through in the, in those games in Indy. I like that. He's a proven defender. I like that he's a proven guy who can get to the basket. He can get you to the basket. Right. And everything, a lot of other stuff you can work on, but like stuff like that, I don't think you can teach. So he's got like those two attributes, um, you know, in like the most perfect world, I'm going to go find a, uh, you know, a six, three, six, four guard who as an emergency, you know, break the glass, put him in, make him the point guard. Cause two months into the season, Frankie can't do it. You know, you can potentially slide him over, but that's also like, what are the odds of finding that? You know, yeah. I mean, Jesus, you'd love to bring in a, a six, four guard who has enough ball screen skills to play point guard if you need, but also shoots 40% from three and plays great defense, but <laughs> get one of those NBA free agency. So it's a little <laughs> tough. Because if someone was that good and that big and they fit all those boxes, they would probably be going to the league. But I do think there's a point like you can play multiple on ball guards and you can bring in someone to play the two who might be some of those things. They're not obviously not Mm going to do all of that, but that might be the move. Um, And there's no one at that spot. Right. But it's still like, man, I. It's just I don't know what to think, like. Like Xavier Simpson was very similar to Frankie Collins statistically, probably at this point in his career, Um, even Darius Morris. But Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's always going to result in, okay, make that jump as a soft, right? There's a lot of risk there. And so much of it too is based on what's going to be the personnel around him too. Because if you're going to tell me, all right, Dickinson's back, Houston's back, you know, even Diabate's back, whatever, then you're like, all right, you know, I'm more willing to be like, let's roll with it and see how it goes. Because, like, even when Xavier Simpson was becoming a sophomore, well, he had pros around him. Like, yeah, he was coming off ball screens and hitting dudes for three-pointers who ended up in the NBA. If if there's a, a mass exodus and you're telling me now Frankie's the point guard with this group that's going to kind of be cobbled together a little bit, like, I don't – that I don't know if you can do. If everyone else leaves, you almost have to go out and get the best point guard possible. Or shock to bring creator, in. yeah. Like, because you – If you're looking at Frankie Collins, Kobe Bufkin, Jet Howard, Terrence Williams, and Terrence Reed as your starting lineup, then I don't feel great about Frankie Collins. But if Frankie Collins is kind of the 
straw that stirs the drink when you have mm-hmm. one of even one of the bigs back, maybe Caleb Houston back. Yes. Maybe Chet Howard, you have some shooting on the wing and you can kind of space it out and do something. You can do like, that. Okay, then that works. But yes, if it needs to be, okay, well, you don't just need to be a point guard. You need to be the guy that runs the whole, like is a high usage player too. That becomes an even bigger risk. So yeah, I definitely agree with, with that. And again, it shows how connected all these moves are. And Mm -hmm. like there's most of the moves that have to be made, like there's no rush for a lot of these guys to make them, which just puts Michigan in kind of a tough spot to figure out what to, to do with the roster and how to play it. Right. I I think they are in about as uncomfortable as a spot as, as, you can be in this spot. There's just so many moving parts and the residual effects of every decision are, are significant. So, all right, let's get into the big 10 here. Uh, So what do you think? Do you just blow it up? Start over? Are we kicking teams out? Are we bringing teams in? What, what's your say, Kevin Warren? So Kevin Warren cashed like 35 million out of the (laughs) big 10 tournament run, which is second most of any conference. So Kevin Warren is probably sitting back smoking a cigar somewhere, just happy with his, his league's performance. Uh, It was very much a volume play, but they got the job done. Uh, I, I think the first thing to say about the big 10 is I think last year's NCAA tournament was a lot more disappointing. Like there, Mm. the team, the good teams in the big 10 last year, we're supposed to be way better than the good teams in the big 10 this year. Like last year, the big 10 was losing one seeds, two seeds, top 10, top 15 Ken Palm teams. Well, that is fair. This yeah. year, the league we said all along, like didn't have those elite contenders as much as it just had a lot of like good to pretty good. So teams. for reference, so la- last year's big 10 had five teams that were a four seed or better, w- including two one seats and two two and had, and had the performance that it had this year had two three seeds one four seed so yes your high end stuff last year was way more of a black eye than this year this year just feels so much worse because it comes on the heels of last year yeah and i agree with that and i i think it's also there are all these lottery picks that people talked about here keegan murray ej liddell johnny davis jaden ivy and I don't think really any of them had a great NCAA tournament, right? Like, so no. that's a little disappointing and it just, it makes you question things, man. Uh, I, I don't think it's a, do you think it's a playing style thing? Like, is it the reliance on post-up play? Cause a lot of the team, like the teams that lost didn't even really lose that way. Right. Like I would, it wasn't a post-up team this year. They were small. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, do you make it into a style of play thing or like, what is it? I don't think there's a unifying theory. I, I really like, is it t- by total chance? Probably. I, I mean, is it a 20, it, like the 20 game schedule against good teams? Like, well, the big 12 was better than the big 10 this year. Kansas made it through just fine. Um, you know, Gonzaga played in the WCC and they got knocked out in the sweet 16, you know, or whenever the hell they went down. You know, the, the Big East isn't exactly a walk in the park, and Villanova made it through again. Um, ACC was trash, and they got two teams. So, I don't know. Um, Who's the most disappointing Big Ten team? Purdue. Even though they were one of only two teams to make the Sweet 16. Yes. Purdue. Okay. I – I think that they, they lost just, to St. Peter's. Yeah, that I I was going to say <laughs> Purdue also. But I'm just like some of the other, mm, Iowa pretty disappointing. Iowa was Iowa was shockingly disappointed. Well, not shockingly, but painfully disappointing. I should say. Wisconsin was expected. Totally. Um, so that doesn't do much. I think Illinois got a tough, tough draw. Uh, but Purdue, it was all right there, man. And yeah, Illinois got hosed by that. No one, no one needed to be playing. With that Houston team was just a bunch of beast, man. They were just killers. So um I feel like they I feel like Illinois would have won other games that day. Um Purdue, I just I can't with that. I mean pretty Purdue ridiculous. Just kinda... Even if they lost a Saint, even if they lost to Murray State, I would have been like, Well, you know, okay, I guess whatever you get upset, but like you can't lose to a Mac team in the Sweet 16 when you have a top 10 pick two 
bigs that, that have never the Mac teams have never seen anything like. You got, you know, a fifth year shooter, you got this, you got that. Just ridiculous. And I don't know what to make of Purdue. Where where do you go from here? It it's gotta be it's such a disappointing year for me, not because they didn't win anything or whatever else, but they just never seem to really play well the last yeah. two months of the year. It never clicked. Like it, I don't know. I was never like that team that beat Villanova earlier in the year. I was like, Oh yeah, this is it. Like Purdue is going to be Purdue's going to the final four. Yeah. I, I kind of thought so too. And the, I think if you look at the three point shooting, it just gradually fell off as the year went on. Like they didn't shoot 40% from three over their last like 10 games, basically. And those, all those role players early in the year were hitting threes, right? Mason Gillis, Sasha Stefanovic, uh, Isaiah Thompson, like all these guys. And it just, they kind of stopped going in. And what's weird to me is I was all like more ball screens for Jaden Ivey, more ball screens for Jaden Ivey that worked for like that three week stretch kind of in January. And then it sort of just completely fell apart because he couldn't really process the game well enough and make decisions well enough. And they kind of got away from the Purdue of old. And then you go down in the NCAA tournament and he's nine points on four of 12 shooting with six turnovers, the two assists. Like he couldn't really be the guy I think we thought. And I don't know if that's because they tried to switch to that ball screen right. offense halfway through the year or what, but it just never clicked down the stretch in a way that I think everyone thought it could and seemed like it would at a certain point. And like, there was just a little, like the turnovers, like never figuring out turnovers, you know, like that just kind of always just seemed these, these things that just seem to be there where you're like, it doesn't feel like this should be an issue for this team. And it just constantly was. And the, and the, the deep, like defense and turnovers, you're just like, how, how is it that bad sometimes? Yeah, well, because Jaden Ivey would just throw the ball different places sometimes, and Travion Williams has to throw four to five behind the back passes every game. <laughs> and it was just like, I, I don't know. One thing that I saw noted, all the teams that made the Final Four are like in the bottom 60 spots in depth, and I do think, or like bench minutes, and I do think part of Purdue's undoing was this like, multi-headed team not one coherent team right their two best players can't two of their three best players can't play yes. at the same time so you have to yeah. either do the Zach Eady thing the Travion Williams thing or the Jade Ivey thing and I don't think any of them fit together perfectly which is probably this team's undoing in the end but it also just the simple fact that they're the fifth best three-point shooting team in the country and just didn't shoot it well in the last month of the year and sometimes that's all it takes so what's your what's your rating of Illinois disappointment that uh, I know it, it sucks that they ran into Houston, but I also don't feel like that thing was trending the right way regardless. Yeah, I mean, they had to bench Cabello in the second half yes, of the NCAA sure did. tournament game that knocked them out. That's not really what you want. And they could have lost in the first round. I mean, probably should have. Uh, yep. You're telling me. <laughs> like it I don't know and I do think some of it maybe is it that mental energy of fighting for a Big Ten championship like they did win the Big Ten and that was a huge goal for that team mm-hmm. um, after what happened the last year and it came down to the last day whatever else but then they just I don't know it I mean I think the combination of, was hurt too that seems to play a factor well he was his hand was hurt and he had pink eye down the stretch. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, cause he, he was a completely different player in the last two weeks. He was like five um, of 28 from three, the last five yeah, games. It was that br- changes it, everything. It, to see a guy like that go out that way was that sucked. Um, Chris, so Curbelo, is he back next year? What do you think? I mean, I, I feel like he probably needs a fresh start. Yeah. Uh, then maybe that comes in that environment without Kofi, whatever else, but you look down these big 10 teams, how many teams in the big 10 aren't losing their best player. Right. Right. So I feel like the whole league took a step back this year. And now all these teams like Illinois is probably going to lose Kofi. Wisconsin's going to lose Johnny Davis. Purdue is going to lose Jaden Ivy. I was going to lose Keegan Murray. Ohio state's going to lose EJ Liddell. Rutgers is losing Ron Harper. 
Michigan NGA. State, I'm not even sure who their best player is, so I don't know who to say that they're losing, but they're losing Gabe Brown, who was all Big Ten. And Bingham. And Bingham. Indiana, uh, Trace Jackson Davis might move on, um, might get a big name and likeness package. Like So Maryland, Northwestern, all these teams, right? And yep. that happens every year, right? That's part of the game, but I – I don't see maybe the breakout stars in the league that you would have expected. I feel like we could say like, wow, Jaden Ivey is going to be really good last year. I yeah. don't know who that guy is next year. Um, there's obviously some key NBA decisions that still have to be made, whatever else, but I, I don't feel great about the league overall. No, not at all. I agree. I agree with that. Um, low key Michigan state is sitting there probably looking pretty good for next year in reality when you go through like what some of these places are losing and the questions that they face, Michigan state has arguably a degree of stability um, in terms of those guys who are going to be second, third, fourth year players, you know? Uh, yeah. Especially if Christie's back. Um, exactly. But is that, is there a breakthrough guy? That's the question with a team like Michigan state. Um, sure. I don't know. Ohio state, if Malachi comes back, they could be really fun. Um, mm-hmm. I got to think he's going to play his way. Like he has the, probably the best draft stock of any of the like really young players in the league. Is he really coming back? I don't know. He played so well the last month of the year. I'd go get that, get that bag. Um, yeah. Old I mean, Man- Illinois, Illinois could be interesting coming back, even without Coburn um, and Frazier um, and Demonte Williams is going Jesus. And Alfonso uh, Plummer. He could be back. Couldn't he? Could he? Does he have a COVID year? I thought he played three years at Utah, and this was his first year at Illinois. He would potentially still have a fifth from COVID. Uh, I he's, think. Li- he's listed as a senior this year at Illinois and a senior last year at Utah, so I'm not sure. But it could be a redshirt situation. If he has a redshirt in the COVID year. so yeah, He's only played three years of college basketball. Okay, so maybe he could be back. Um I haven't followed that that closely, but it's like, so yeah. you're going to have I think Plummer, overall, overall Hawkins. I agree with your point. The, yeah. RJ Melendez, Goody. Shit, Melendez and Goody were their two best players against Houston. And they by a lot. 53 points. <laughs> <laughs> Is Grandison um, gone too? Yeah. I don't think so. Well, he could have a COVID year, I guess. Yeah. Where's he going? He'll play. Sometimes people just want to grow up, man. That's like, true. I don't know, like Iowa, if Chris Murray is Keegan 2.0, that could be useful. Yeah, but uh, what does that get you? Great. Another trip to the second round of the tournament. See you later. First round. <laughs> first first round. round. They lost in the first round of the tournament. <laughs> um, all right. Your final four picks, and then we got to roll. Final four picks. So, to be honest, I haven't watched that many of the games since Purdue lost because I've just been in Big Ten depression here. But uh, sure, I will go with Kansas over Duke. That's not fun. That's what I was going to take. So you're going to have to pick Duke. You just want to see the Coach K farewell tour. I don't. Live and in person. I really don't. (laughs) don't. I'll be writing Villanova this week until they are out. Um, Obviously a brutal draw for them. Losing Justin Moore in the last 36 seconds left in that game. So very curious to see what they can cobble together. Um, yeah, that Duke North Carolina game, that's going to be sweet, though. That will be sweet. Um, just in terms of watching, you know, the game. I mean, it's Duke North Carolina in K's final, final four. I, it's just, even if you're not a Duke guy, you, you, if you're a college basketball fan, that's incredible. Um, I mean, I hear people being like, oh, it's a blue blood final four. What's wrong with that? I, I mean, I think this is a, an incredible final four. I think someone told you that before the tournament, you said there's no front runners. It's the year mid major is going to go. I said, I think it's the year that that's high right. majors. No one expects are going to make the tournament. North Carolina. There you go. Um, that's a good call. I uh, think that I, no one would have thought North Carolina when they beat the shit out of Michigan on December 1st was going to be in the final four though. The Michigan fans are ready to cancel the season because they lost the <laughs> UFC and now they're this dominant team. It's, I don't, they're kind of, I don't know what to really make of it. Like 
at that time they were talented, right? And it, so it kind of it's not that surprising, but they've just reached a new level, really. Um, so well, that yeah, when I mean, at over at that when at Duke sort of changed everything for them, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest key was that it got past Baylor in the second round in OT. It's kind of like Michigan's run <laughs> when when they you could have very well lost that game against Houston. Pool makes a shot, suddenly you get into the Sweet 16, you win two more games there. Um, like by beating Baylor in overtime, you know, that kind of set this up. They just beat St. Peter's in the Elite Eight to get to the point. Like, how much of it is the draw? How much of it is, you know, how well they're playing? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, St. Peter's obviously is lucky, but I think UCLA was a, a tough Sweet 16. UCLA is like, a good UC- team. Yeah. UCLA is a team that before the year you would have thought, had a real chance to make the final four. And I think still kind of played up to that level. They just fell short in that game. Right. So I don't know. I, agree. I just, just think it, 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 this could have just as easily been Baylor in this final four. Yeah. I mean, I picked Marquette. How'd that look? They got fucking drilled. <laughs> Did they lose by like 30? 32. <laughs> so Wait, you took the Marquette to the final four? No, to beat North Carolina. Oh, 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 oh okay. I think Not I actually think I had four. that too. Um, but it just shows it's all about getting hot at the right time, I guess. I like, and I the fact that these guys played less than a month ago, it's not like Duke's gonna be like scaring North Carolina off, right? These dudes are gonna no. say, "All right, let's go." Oh, and the place is gonna be absolutely buzzing. Uh, Seventy thousand in the Superdome. This is gonna be pretty sweet. So it's, it's gonna be a big week down there in New Orleans. You gotta be pace yourself. Trying, man. Trying. All right. Well, yeah. we got this um, knocked out. We'll we will uh, probably have more to follow up on as things come. We will pictures. be. You'll be out at Augusta doing whatever yeah, you do. We'll figure something we're gonna, out. Though. We'll get into our off season stuff post Masters and kind of try to come up with some kind of schedule of breaking down Michigan, breaking down Michigan State. And frankly, talking about those programs right now doesn't make any sense until we have roster clarity as it is because it's is, this is not what it was four years ago. Um, it is so dramatically different in terms of, you know, we used to only be talking about NBA decisions and waiting for those to come through. Now it's, there's 10,000 things going on. Coaches, pros, yeah, transfers. I mean, there's crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. So, all right, we do appreciate everyone. For listening, we hope you enjoy your final four weekends and uh, enjoy the Masters and read uh, my coverage uh, on The Athletic. I hope you do, because I'm, I'm basically popping up at Augusta, like knocking on the door, being like, what's what's going on in here? I have no idea what's happening in golf, but we'll make it work. Uh, make sure you subscribe to UM Hoops. Read all of Dylan's um, kind of season wrap-up stuff. It's as good as you'll find. And uh, we love you all.